Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, and today we're talking about offerings and sacrifices. Now, today is Rosh Hashanah, the memorial of blowing of trumpets. And over here in Leviticus chapter 23, while it's giving us instruction on the first day of the seventh month, there in verse 24, this is part of the feast of the Lord. We see there in verse 25, it says, Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, you know, in these days, there is a lot of debate over the offerings, particularly because of the prophecy in Malachi chapter three hasn't been fulfilled yet, at least not for everybody. It says there that he's going to start with the Levi's which is the firstborns, and they will start doing sacrifices and offerings. Like it says there in verse four, the offerings will be pleasant as they were in former years, but the rest of the world is still under the impression that we're not supposed to do these offerings at all. But I'm not so sure because over in first Peter in chapter two, it talks about our spiritual house. That third temple was actually is a spiritual temple and how we are the stones that will make up that temple. But it goes on in the verse to say how we will offer up spiritual sacrifices. So are we supposed to be making spiritual sacrifices? Now, a lot of times when I start thinking on this, just like you guys, I'll start thinking about what the Messiah did. And when we're looking at him back there in Jerusalem and what he did there around the first day of the seventh month, there's no record of him making any type of blood sacrifice. And I know what you're thinking. Somebody down there is going to say, duh, the Messiah did away with all of the sacrifices. Now, guys, you're going to have a little bit of harder time convincing people like me. We're so used to people telling us what we are not supposed to be doing that we just don't listen anymore. The Bible tells us we're supposed to keep the law, but you will have one person that tells you you're supposed to keep the law while you have a hundred people to tell you that you're not. So anytime somebody comes and say, you, oh, we ain't got to worry about this and we ain't got to do that, we immediately discount you and blow you off because we know that there's so many people taking advantage of the law of liberty right now and are not obedient to the scripture. And like Psalms chapter one, the very first chapter in Psalms says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners. So anybody who is not keeping the law is ungodly and is a sinner. So when they start talking about how we're not supposed to do this and how we're not supposed to do that, yeah, we, we adhere to what Psalms chapter 1 and we don't take their counsel. But what is it that we are supposed to be doing? What are these spiritual sacrifices? For that, I want to jump over to the book called Sirach. This is a book very, very similar to Proverbs. Some Sometimes people refer to it as Proverbs Great Granddaddy because it has so much detail in it. And as far as wisdom, knowledge and understanding comes out of this book. But anyway, down in chapter 35, we see an entire section that's talking about the law and sacrifices. So what I plan to do is just step through some of these and see if this is what Peter was talking about, that spiritual sacrifice. Let's go ahead and get into it. Verse one says, he who keeps the law makes many offerings. He who heeds the commandments sacrifices a peace offering. And this is this is very, very true. Guys, if once you start keeping the law and you start understanding, you know, all of the elements of the law, the more you read the law, the more sacrifices you have to make. Primarily your own self, your own body, do you have to uh, change and get rid of, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we used to do. You, you hear a lot of newcomers, a lot of times they, they complain, they say, you know, I, I feel like I'm losing myself. I feel like I can't be me. Well, you know, join the club, guys. We all had to go through this where we all had to go through these changes. That's what the Bible means when it says we have to die daily, meaning those things that we are used to doing and like doing once we start getting in obedience to the law, 
those things are going to fall off of us and then we're going to have to end up being changed to people. We end up losing ourselves. So uh, don't be like those who try to save their own life, you know, because what the scripture says is those who attempt to save their life, meaning those who try to keep their own identity will be those who actually end their life or lose their life altogether because, you know, it, it will be those who are obedient to these commandments and have made these changes that will be allowed to go on to the next level. But anyway, verse two says he who returns a kindness offers fine flour and he who gives alms sacrifices a thank offering. So returning a kindness, somebody doing something for us is like the offering of fine flour. Well, that's what it's saying here. Um, and that's one of the first offerings I did. You know, I, I fall into that group that's talked about over and there in Malachi chapter three. I have been making burnt offerings for a while. And one of the first offerings that I made was just fine flour. Um, it was actually out of an um, act of desperation. Uh, understanding that these offerings are supposed to, you know, have some help involved for us. I grabbed some fine flour and put it on a uh, altar that I had built out of some stone there. And so my point is, is that this is actually the first offering that people start to make this fine flour. When you read in the Old Testament, it kind of starts with just fine flour and then it goes on to bread and then it goes on to other things you know you kind of like uh builds all the way up until you're actually burning a whole cow on the altar you know so my point is that this is where we start well if this be where we start then what it says return a kindness so those who are returning this kindness are doing this um act of this offering with this fine flour and then it says and he who gives alms sacrifices a thank offering and that makes sense I mean we're realizing who it is that is the author or who it is that is the originator of those things that we have um, he, he is the the creator of wealth talking about our father so if we have wealth at all even the evil guy you know he, he doesn't recognize our father he's blasphemous or whatever but he's you know living pretty wealthy he too has gotten his wealth from our father our father is the only one who gives people wealth or gives people the lack thereof but the point is is that once you start doing alms deeds now you recognize who your wealth came from and so that's being thankful you're being thankful for what he has given and you show that thanks not by jumping up and down and say oh we look what god gave me but actually taking what he has given you and sharing it with somebody who is less fortunate that's why he gives us the wealth anyway at least us who are in service of him he gives us wealth so we can share with other people so it makes perfect sense that doing alms deeds is a thank offering. Now, looking at verse three, it says to keep from wickedness is pleasing to the Lord and to forsake unrighteousness is atonement. And this is important, you know, especially in the time that we're in now. Um, like we said, we're right here at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the memorial of blowing of trumpets. Well, this actually starts the 10 days of awe, 10 days in which we all have to have a repentant heart leading up to the day of atonement. So what we're doing and be, be sure you, you, you understand what I'm saying here is now starting until the day of atonement, we're reflecting on ourselves and what it is that we've done. Um, I'm working on a uh, another video. Um, a, a, I believe our father has revealed to me why it was that they were looking at a snake on a pole back there in the wilderness with Moses. Now, I heard in the legends of the Jews how the snake itself wasn't important, but the fact that they were gazing at this snake was actually a deflection, so to speak, onto our father. It was like they were uh, being obedient to him while they were uh, gazing at this snake and this brass or this metal snake on this pole. And so, like I said, I heard that in the legends of the Jews. But while thinking on this um, and still wondering, because I've been trying to figure this out for years, what I believe I understand now is the snake represents our sin. Like, you know, we read over in the Third Testament um, and how we read over in uh, the book of Revelation, how this serpent is trying to get us. Well, we read over in the Shepherd of Hermas in similitudes that this serpent 
is actually made up of the powers, the same powers that Peter said over in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And then we learn over in the Shepherd of Hermes what those powers are. They, they are things like perfidiousness, incontinence, infidelity, pleasure, sadness, malice, lust, anger, lying, foolishness, pride, and hatred. That is the serpent that's actually trying to destroy us. That's who Michael is fighting against as he kicks this serpent out of the kingdom of heaven. What he's talking about in the book of Revelation is how he is exterminating these wicked spirits here or these spirits of darkness. These origins of low vibrations are being removed from us during this trial period. And so what I believe the father has revealed to me as far as the serpent that they were gazing on and how that relates to us now is after we have done an act and we are paying for that act. We have to now gaze on what it is that we did in order to be forgiven. For instance, if I get angry with somebody and, you know, it ends up in jail or ends up, you know, getting hurt or ends up in a fight or something like that, you know, while I'm laying there wounded, uh, you know, I could, you know, just be mad about it and say, you know, that, that was messed up. It happened like that. Or I can gaze on the snake by remembering the fact that I was the cause of that. I was the one who was angry. And by me being angry, I've caused these things to come up on me. And so by doing that, I'm actually gazing on the snake and doing so actually gives us the forgiveness and the repentance and puts us in that repentant heart, which is necessary for us to be forgiven of that what we did. So, you know, you have the snake that's trying to kill you. And then once he's bitten you, because you got to remember that part in it, he's already bit you there. And, you know, you, you, you have the poison that's flowing through your veins. And so they were supposed to go gaze on the snake before they actually died. Well, before foolishness or pride completely takes you back to the abyss, we have to reflect on the fact that we are prideful and foolish. And so that calms us back down and gets us back to where we can actually get back on track so i believe that's what that all means but i'll continue to work on that as we get prepared for that other video make sure you subscribe so you can see when it comes out we're gonna get back over here into sarak and you see where he where it says to keep from wickedness is pleasing to our lord and to forsake unrighteousness is atonement so we have that snake that is bitten us like i said the anger has bitten us and so we are forsaken that anger by gazing back on that snake and so that is atonement and uh bring this up again in case you don't get to see it any of the other videos we put out we are in the 10 days of this atoning period atonement day is actually 10 days long it takes 10 days for us to reflect on that unrighteousness that we've been involved in so that we can get our atonement there on the 10th day but anyway let's go on verse 4 says do not appear before the lord empty-handed for all these things are to be done because of the commandment and so what sirach is saying is this is what we are doing in order to make these offerings is to make these changes in our life and this is necessary guys um my backlog is getting a bit long here that's why i'm putting out so many videos here lately praise our father in heaven you know for all of the information he's allowing us here in these end times but one of the videos that i want to talk about is why our father hates our feast days we hear this all the time especially from those same people that tell us that we're not supposed to be doing offerings they're the same people that tell us that we're not supposed to be keeping feast days because you know we were told that he hates those and he despises our feast days well i found in the scripture why it is that he despises the feast days is because we are actually making them unclean we are when we are unclean we are actually and we go to his feast days we are making the elements of his sacrifice unclean just like he, you know he said back there in other words, we are coming before the Lord empty handed. We haven't done anything to clean ourselves up, but yet we're standing there in his sacrifices and such. And so I think that's why it's important that we understand, you know, what is saying here um, as far as what it is we're supposed to be doing, keeping the law. Uh, kindness, uh, doing alms, charitable deeds. Those those are things we learn in the third testament of the Bible and in Malachi uh, chapter four how to activate the Elijah spirit. 
uh, reading the law, reading and obeying, not just reading, but obeying the law, uh, doing charitable deeds and preparing ourselves. We read over in the third testament it is the way we activate the Elijah spirit. And so I believe that's what it's talking about here and how we can come to our father, you know, with something in our hands, having making these spiritual sacrifices in our lives. Now, verse six says the offering of a righteous man anoints the altar and its pleasing odor rises before the most high. Now, we have to remember where the altar is at. Now, this is a document from over in the book of Clarence Larkin, and it shows the three different tabernacles. You had the heavenly tabernacle, which, you know, we'll get there and get to see that one day. You have the earthly tabernacle, which we did get to see at one point, and then we destroyed it or they destroyed it or whatever. But then you have the tabernacle within man. But in each one of these tabernacles, there is an altar. And turns out uh, this altar now, this spiritual altar, is inside of us somewhere close to our conscious. And so what he says here is that the offering of a righteous man anoints that altar. That is what's putting the blood on that particular altar is by doing righteous deeds. And this righteousness is also the pleasing odor, which would be the incense altar as well. Now, verse seven says the sacrifice of a righteous man is acceptable and the memory of it will not be forgotten. So the things that we're having to go through, you know, this is to our benefit is actually while we're in this time period here not only are we in the 10 days of all but we're actually in the 10 years of all which started back there in the year 2016 right after that tetrad back there we saw in 2014 that was a signal that was the beginning of the regathering of our father's people back there at the end of that tetrad making the yearly the year-long rosh hashanah to start in 2016 followed immediately by that revelations 12 sign in the sky anyway those were the beginnings of the 10 days of all or the 10 years that we have of repentance until we get to around 2024 which will be the eve of atonement and the time in which we can expect some of these catastrophic events to come and humble the world that's what this is all about. You know, the people who are waiting on the rapture, that's what they're actually waiting on. This is Israel's time to be regathered and to get back where they're supposed to be. You know, they say that Israel is supposed to recognize the Messiah in the end times. Well, that's what these 10 years are about. Israel is actually getting back into the law, back into the calendar, back into the feast days, back into obedience back into our father's way of doing things and then once they have been reunited around the law like the third testament says once we've been reunited around the law then the earth and the stars will be shaken but anyway looking at verse 8 it says glorify the lord generously and do not stint the first fruits of your hands so i guess what he's saying here is that these sacrifices are our first fruits the first things we will offer up will be us burning our sin at the altar you know getting rid of and cleaning ourselves up making ourselves uh an acceptable offering to him would be our first fruits if i'm understanding this correctly but y'all can help me out then in the comments section Looking at verse 9, it says, With every gift, show a cheerful face and dedicate your tithe with gladness. Now, this is kind of odd because this doesn't point to a spiritual thing here. It's, it doesn't give us a spiritual equivalent to our tithes. And that's probably because just like it is now, our Levi's. And our priests are actually dependent on us and our tithes. That's how they're able to do what they do. You know, they aren't really expected to grow crops like we are. They aren't really expected to, you know, have jobs and, and, and you know, keep society going like we are. They are actually dedicated to the services of the temple. And many of them actually spend all day long studying the word 
all of their time is devoted to making sure that not only they have a good understanding of the laws in the Bible, but they are making sure that we do too, sharing that information with us. And it is our responsibility to give them our tithes. That's 10% of anything we get. You know, if we go to the store to buy 10 gallons worth of gasoline, well, we're supposed to give them one gallon of that gasoline. That's how they get to drive around in their car else the whole system breaks down and we end up with the common man trying to teach us the laws and stuff and you know we're warned against that like we read over in psalms chapter one so that's what it's saying here every gift show a cheerful face and dedicate your ties with gladness meaning you know don't don't do them begrudgingly Else we could be like those over in the book of Malachi chapter 3 who are robbing our father by not giving the tithes and offerings. So I guess that's why there's not a spiritual equivalent to that. It just tells us to be cheerful when we do so. But anyway, verse 10 says, give to the most high as he is given and as generously as your hand has found. And this this is important. Guys, like we said, our father is the author of our wealth. He is the creator of our wealth. And if we don't recognize that, then, you know, there's coming a day when we're going to lose what we have. Um, actually paying tithes and making offerings is what actually protects that what we have. In other words, if, if we're not paying tithes on, you know, what we are given, we don't have the insurance. And so we could actually end up losing everything that we have. That's why I made the distinction earlier when I was saying that our father's people are given uh, wealth so that they can share with others. Well, the enemy, the, the evil guy, he's given wealth for his own destruction. You know, that's why some people are actually able to win the whole lottery millions of dollars do they receive at one time and then you look at them several years later and they're living on the street and poor and hungry is because their wealth was used to destroy them and so anytime you see somebody who is hoarding their wealth and not paying tithes and not doing offerings um recognizing who's the author of that wealth well they're kind of being set up they're going to be the same people who are now building all of these houses and storing up all of this food well somebody else is going to get to enjoy those houses and all that food once they're gone but anyway Verse 11 says, for the Lord is the one who repays and he will repay you sevenfold. So whatever you give, he's saying he's going to uh, pay you sevenfold. So it's kind of interesting that it goes into so much detail down there as far as tithes and, and that kind of thing. Um, not really making a spiritual equivalent as it did with the other offerings and stuff. So we'll do more study on this uh, going forward, see if we um, get some type of revelation on why this is. Um, or maybe we already understand it, you know, that, you know, he, if he still requires those tithes and offerings, even though he doesn't really require blood sacrifices anymore. But y'all let me know what y'all think in the comment section and I'll see you down there. Shalom.